Hello and welcome to the Managing Madrid podcast on a beautiful, beautiful Sunday, which was about as perfect as it can get when Real Madrid were up 3-0, running up the scoreline against a helpless Rafa Benitez side. And then, just when you thought it couldn't be any more perfect, Arda Guler comes on late, and much to the celebration of the entire country of Turkey and all the great, beautiful Turkish football fans on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook. Congratulations. If you're happy, we're happy. So Arda Guler coming in to score a goal. Let's not forget, through a Danny Ceballos, beautiful through pass, also came in off the bench. We've got to give Ceballos some love. He hasn't received much love because he hasn't played well this year and he's been injured. But Ceballos, Arda Guler combining to make it 4-0 for Real Madrid. And Ball Rudiger. New special power in the team. He is unstoppable with a bald head. I mean, he was already unstoppable with the fade. Now with the bald head, he might as well be Thanos. Also joining me today, live on YouTube, and also in your ears on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, is Lucas Navarrete. And just joining the stage now, Jose Perez. What's up, guys? Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, Kian, I'm doing fine. Looking forward to, to this episode. Jose, just in time. Yeah, we. I just uh, wax lyrical about Arda Guler and Antonio Rudiger. So you're you're just in time to yeah. just in time to keep everything. it. Yes, so we're gonna have a lot to talk about. Thanks, Kian. Hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna be talking about Rudiger being like opposite Samson. The less hair he has, the better. <laughs> Unfortunately, like the thing with lesser hair is that you can't really go less. Like anything yeah. less, you're cutting into his skull. But like if we could, we would go less hair, but we can't. <laughs> but look, Rudiger's been awesome anyway. I think we're just kind of having some fun here. But um, he did leap with two great headers. Both of them led to goals. And uh, where should we start? I'm going to start here, actually. Um, Jose, I saw that you were kind of tweeting about the, uh, the double pivot with Kamavinga and Modric. And it honestly, it took me a while to figure out how this team had lined up in midfield. And one of the interesting things positional in the last few games is that like a lot of the players in our midfield occupy the same positions, you know, in their best position, like Kamavinga and Cruz both occupy left central midfield. Modric and Fede, typically right central midfield. So when these guys are paired together, I'm always just kind of curious, like where the pieces will fall. And I was trying to figure out. So, like, Kamavinga was on the left. Modric was in the middle to start the game. Fede on the right. And I was like, is Modric taking the cruise role where he's playing the six when the ball has when when the team has the ball deep? And then Kamavinga switches with him on defense. And then I see Modric running into the box and then Fede covering. And I, I came to the conclusion that it was mostly a Kamavinga Modric double pivot that was sometimes interchangeable if if one of them went up and Fede maybe dropped. I was curious. So I'm just curious to know what your interpretation and your explanation of it was. Yes. So from my side, I see it mostly as that, like as a Modric kind of being a double pivot. Uh, the, the thing that makes it to me like not a 4-3-3, not a regular midfield trio, is that a lot of times Fede was just out on, like out on the right, like not, like interior, not eight, like it was more like right midfielder. Uh, so there were many times where he was just receiving out on the wing. So, and, and then when the team, and then the interesting, the other thing that to me showed that it's more four for two is when the team defended, because when the team defended, actually it wasn't defending like in a four, three, three block or in a four, one, four, one, like it wasn't defending in a four, in a four, three, three variation. It was actually a four, four, two, where what you saw was very interesting because Brahim would then switch positions with Vini and then Brahim would drop that, would drop and, and be like your left midfielder. Fede would be your right midfielder and you end up with this flat 4-4-2 four, four, and then Rodrigo and Vini like out there as strikers. So it did behave as a 4-4-2 four, four, there. Then when they had the ball, the interesting thing is that then Brahim and, and Vini would kind of switch and then Vini would stay out on the left, like wide on the left, and then Brahim would kind of drop a bit deeper and try to help with build-up tasks and stuff like that. So it was a very interesting configuration that, honestly, I liked a lot, as I said, like as I was tweeting, because of how it uh, optimizes for Kamavinga. 
but also I think a trend in Ancelotti's Real Madrid, like every year that he's coached Real Madrid, is that I feel like Ancelotti's Real Madrid defends better in a 4-4-2 than in a 4-3-3. It tends to be messier when the team tries to defend in 4-3-3. In so I kind of like when I see a 4-4-2 block like today. Lucas, thoughts on lineup, performance, first half? Um, I think I think we would all agree it was the first half performance was fine, and obviously second half by extension more than fine. What did you think? I liked it. I liked it. I think that it's very good to see Real Madrid in cruise control, being able to still take care of uh, of business in in such a way through that maybe you could have possibly wished uh, to put the nail in the coffin maybe a little bit earlier so that you know more reserves could have been used maybe more minutes for Guler and Ceballos there but obviously it's still very good to to still again being capable of earning the three points in comfortable fashion without putting together really a very uh, intense or physical effort in that in that regard so it's always good to get the three points in this kind of fashion in at home i'm i'm more than fine with uh, with the performance it wasn't ideal it wasn't very intense or anything like that but again cruise control wins are always needed in in la liga and this was uh, one of those uh, one of those things we got into a bunch of good positions today that didn't result in the goal and we still scored four goals and i'm looking at the attack and the midfield. And there was a lot of conversation. I forget who it was that brought this up um, on Twitter, on the managing Madrid staff that, you know, maybe you look at switching the positions of Brahim and Rodrigo, but I thought it was fluid enough that you're kind of seeing them interchange anyway. Uh, I did want to, you know, I think we'll, we'll table Rodrigo for a second because I think he is a talking point for better or worse, but I kind of want to lead with this. I really like Kamavinga's performance today. And mm-hmm. I just thought the amount of ground he covered. And Jose, you talked about him at the six as well. And, and that possibly being his best position. I still think it's LCM where he where he plays at his best. And there are question marks of like, you know, what does that mean for Chu? Many of Kama's best, Kamavinga's best position is at the six. So I think, you know, ideally, whenever Cruz retires, which hopefully never, you probably mm-hmm. go Chu, many six, and Kamavinga as the eight type of deal as your best way of fitting them or in a double pivot. But I liked him a lot in this game. I thought the amount of ground he covered, his challenges defensively, he's defending deep in our box, he's putting in good challenges, he's reading passing lanes while he's tracking really well, he is carrying the ball. Um, and I love when he gets in those advanced positions at the top of the box. He's hard to dispossess. He's bouncing off players that can't get the ball off him. Three shots today in the first half. Not effective necessarily, but I'm fine with him taking those. I like it. I, I like, you know, and I was reminded of it because Real Madrid before the game on their social media, they posted a, a clip of one of his long range goals. I forget who would, who was against. And I'm like, yeah, more Kamavinga shots. I like it. I like when he shoots. I liked his performance today a lot. I thought he was fantastic on both ends of the field. Yeah, we're getting to see. I think that he's, uh, he's a, a defensive midfielder, really a pivot. We were wrong last year, I think. At least I was, because I thought that his best position was probably as a central midfielder. Now it's pretty clear to me that right now at this point in time, at this stage of his career, he's more comfortable as a pivot, even though he's obviously not a traditional one. He's not a pure anchor by any means. He likes freedom. He likes to to charge forward and move forward and kind of reach those uh, positions close to the box where he can maybe shoot, maybe definitely pass as well. So he's not a pure defensive midfielder, but he he's definitely more comfortable having the whole field ahead of him rather than receiving the ball backwards to the to the opposition's uh, to the opposition's goal. So a very good performance by Kamavinga in contrast to what we saw maybe in the other day against against Leipzig where maybe he struggled a little bit. But yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear to me right now that he's more comfortable as an offensive midfielder rather than, than as a central midfielder, midfielder. Jose, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think with Kamavinga, the thing is that Kamavinga has a bit what I like to call like the Frankie de Jong problem in that Putting mm-hmm. him just as putting him just as six doesn't quite work for me. But also, if you put him as the eight, like mostly ahead of the ball, he also doesn't look comfortable. Which is why I think for both Frankie and Kamavinga, like their best position on paper 
is kind of double pivot where they're not the only guy like like it as a single pivot i also have concerns but if you put him next to a guy like Tramini or today like it looked like next to uh, next to modric it looks quite good because you also uh, like the thing with Camavinga is that you don't want you want to give him like room to operate you don't want sure. that many people that close to him you just want like it's it seems like he does better when he has more ground ahead of him to run into so it, it it's a bit like that that's what i like about the double pivot setup ideally you'd like to make that in the future work the tramini i think part of the reason like when we played them together sometimes i think what happens is that we have more tramini as like the single pivot six and then camavinga is ahead of him and that setup hasn't worked quite well I think if you have like a true double pivot of the two, which is a bit what France has been trying to do, maybe you can get you can get that to work. But again, that's all. But that to me is kind of a future for when Kroos leaves. Right now, I think yeah. as I think the biggest obstacle right now for Kamavinga is just that he's also a player that needs a lot, that that I think is more comfortable when he has a, a lot of the ball. He's behind the ball. And the player who does a lot of that in Real Madrid is Tony Kroos. And as long as he's the one who kind of directs the team, it's going to be a bit harder for Camavinga to fit in. Uh, remind me, I think at some point before the podcast ends, we should talk about um, Kroos and mm -hmm. just the future of Real Madrid. More of a big picture discussion that we've already had. I was just thinking a lot about it lately. First, we're going to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor, and then we're going to read a couple super chats before we get back to the game. So, today's presenting sponsor, as you guys all know, you guessed it, Manscaped. Manscaped is amazing. Everyone on staff has Manscaped products, deodorants, shavers, uh, lip balm. Lip balm is unreal. Like, I've gone through, I think, three Manscaped lip balms now. Really helps, especially when you're in Madrid. You know, Lucas, you know, when you're in Valencia, it doesn't hit you as much because it's humid. But when you're in Madrid, you go through a lot of Manscaped lip balm. So as we typically do after Real Madrid plays, we give out the Manscaped Man of the Match Award. It goes to the best player on the field who definitely Manscaped before the game started. And we're going to send it over to you, Lucas. Who is today's Manscaped Man of the Match Award? I just struggled picking between Lucas Vazquez and Rudiger, but the fact that he contributed in, in two Real Madrid goals tonight, I have to give it to, to Antonio Rudiger. Okay. I think he was he well, was phenomenal both in defense as usual and also contributing in those in those two goals for 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 the team. Rudiger might be the first person who actually manscaped his head, which is a <laughs> historic achievement. Antonio Rudiger, congratulations for manscaping before the game, therefore picking up the Manscaped Man of the Match Award. Listeners, go to manscaped.com, use code Managing Madrid to get 20% off and free shipping. That's manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the code Managing Madrid. All right, back to the game. We're actually going to take a couple super chats that came in. Nasser Haroun says, Arda Guler, undisputed starter. <laughs> Hold your horses, Nasser. Hold your horses. We got Second City Saints saying, excited for this Champions League draw this Friday. I feel like we can win against teams like City if we go at them and not park the bus like Liverpool did today. The Pop the brakes also, Friday, maybe. Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad someone told me um, the draw is this Friday. I never know when the draw is. I just wake up and everyone's like talking. I'm like, oh, okay, I have to watch the draw. It, guys, if you're interested in um, a live stream during the draw where we react to it, let us know. We might, we might do that on Friday. We mm -hmm. don't have anything else planned. Um, did you guys get a chance to watch City Liverpool? I, I know didn't. some of it, I think, overlapped with our game, but like most of it didn't. I just like... Lucas, watching that and then watching our game was a bit like watching NCAA March Madness and then watching like an NBA game. Like the intensity drop from from the, it was thoroughly entertaining, nonstop, end to end. Both teams aggressive pressing, both teams losing the ball constantly to each other's press. Waves of attack. It was like watching a basketball game, low scoring, but it was incredible. Um, will Real Madrid? Approach City like Liverpool? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Probably maybe the last yeah. twenty minutes of the second leg. I think. I think we can. We can see it. <laughs> um, Ramke says, "Is Vidi the most unsympathetic player in the league?" 
What does that mean? Does that mean people don't sympathize with him? Is that what that means? I think he's criticizing the the yellow card here at tonight, which is fair in my opinion, in my view, even though I got a lot of heat on my mentions on Twitter as I usually do, but yeah, I think it's I think it's hard to defend that <laughs> Lucas, yellow card. Lucas on Twitter right now is is like <clears throat> oil and water. It's not it's not mixing well. I'm like I'm like the Vinicius on Twitter, I think. <laughs> Getting harassed and, and abused by everyone. Yeah. Maybe I'm um, I'm also like I don't know, maybe I'm not helping myself in this regard, but I I think it's it was pretty uh, like a useless yellow card by him and unnecessary one really like it wasn't a dirty tackle it wasn't anything dirty did by Mingueza there obviously I get the frustration and a lot but I think he should have probably restrained himself a little bit I could be wrong but I interpreted this question like people don't sympathize with him enough mm, maybe but I, I I don't know if that's exactly the way he's wording it but um Come on, don't leave know. me alone with this take on the yellow card, man. No, no, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Agree. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree with that because it's just it, it was on like, like yeah, like yeah. The thing about all of this Vinicius debate is that a lot of things can be true at the same time. It's mm-hmm. very clear that Vinny has been receiving racist abuse, and that has definitely like just Affected, worn down his yeah. patience on a lot of exactly. things. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, there are just reactions from him that one cannot defend. What happened today, like, is, yes, it's a fairly shameless shirt pull, but it doesn't merit a reaction like the one Vinny had. Yeah. Here's my take. I think there are two complete extremes on this, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think there's one extreme that says Vinny needs to calm down, he needs to behave better in all this. I don't, I don't agree with that because I, I think people don't put themselves enough in his shoes to, to see what he's dealing with. And really, I think it's kind of unprecedented. And, and Ancelotti spoke about this too before the game, that he's never seen anything like this. He went back and the amount of racist abuse he gets every game, physical abuse, verbal abuse. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that is that, that kind of believe that he's basically has a free pass forever because of mm-hmm. it. And I just think like, so what happened in that yellow card instance in a vacuum is that he got pulled down, was a bad challenge. I mean, he got, he, he, they tried to pull him down the first time. They didn't, he didn't, they didn't succeed. The second one, Vinny really tries to stay on his feet and Minguez is pulling the hell out of him and fouls him and gets a yellow card. I think the yellow card card was needless, right? Um, I I mean, Minguez got a yellow card. That's in the rule book. Like the rule book allows you to do that, and and you're you're going to get a yellow card. Yeah. Now, if you want to get it, if you want to get in his face and bark at him, go for it. But I think the reaction of pushing him was obviously it was a yellow card offense. So both players got their deserved yellow card in that situation. Then that's where what where it ends to me. But I think the one I think I took more issue with rather than today was the Leipzig one where Mm -hmm. he was lucky not to get sent off. That's but. But I, again, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle for those reasons I, I mentioned. I think there's two extremes happening here. Um, yeah, but it's always no middle ground on Twitter, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no middle ground mostly anywhere. Uh, Sheikh Khatiri says, do you think that Nico and Arribas will text Arda tonight that Carlo will never let you play again because he scored? <laughs> that was actually my first thought. I was like, ah, oh, you, you did yourself dirty here, Arda. You'll, you'll, yeah. We'll never see you again. We'll never see you again. No, I'm sure, like, you know, Arda's time will come. I'm really happy for him that he's good goal. Today. Also, he took, he took the goal really well. Took the goal yeah. really well. Good like finish. Confident player. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Back to the game. <clears throat> um, I don't know if this, if this is necessarily talking point like 1B after we talked about Kamavinga as 1A, as it, although, Ru- although Rudiger got the Manscaped Man of the Match award. But if I'm going to give another. I mean, there's a couple. I was looking at the numbers before the game. I was mind blown. Modric had 119 touches, which is like a lot of touches, far and mm-hmm. away the most of anyone on the field. Second on that list was Vasquez with 91. He also had eight key passes, five of them at halftime, another three in the second half. Modric was great tonight. But another one I wanted to circle was Vasquez, actually. I really liked yeah. what Vasquez brought to the right. 
I thought his overloads throughout the game were very helpful. The way he linked up with Fede and Rodrigo in the right half space, played the right passes, the right cutbacks, doing his classic Cristiano stepovers on the right, which today he pulled off. I really like Vasquez tonight, and I really like Modric tonight. So I wanted to single out those two as well. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts. Go ahead, Jose. I'll go after you. Uh, yeah, on that. So on that one, well, in general, like as a team performance, I think after like a few, like after a month of kind of lackluster performances from the team and from certain players, it's just nice to see a game like this one. I would say, and and that applies to Mo, to Modric too. And I think uh, it's interesting to learn lessons from this. Of like, is maybe Modric better off these days playing up like? in a deeper role like he played today because he was more like it, it's a bit like when Carlo decides to play like Gross as the six where it's like we're just going to let him direct play from that posi- from that position um and it worked like it worked quite well today of course you can't do that against every team cuz let's be honest Celta is just not that good it was going to mo- it, it's a team that's kind of weak that was going to set up in a weak block in a uh, in a low block that's a good opportunity to use Modric in that role. So I I do kind of look forward to using him similarly, like in a, like a, in other games, like where we could take advantage of weaker teams that set up in a deep block like this. I think it seems to be uh, a resource that could work well. I agree. It seems to be a good role for him at this stage of his career. I I like to use him. In games like this one where, you know, Real Madrid are going to dominate the game in, in, in a very comfortable way with uh, two great physical players like Valverde and Camavinga kind of protecting him. So I like I like the role he played uh, in today. So, yeah, I agree with Jose here. When Cruz isn't on the field, and I've been thinking a lot about this because my I'm really curious to know what you guys think about this because... One of the com- most common questions we've gotten on this podcast over the last two years is how do Real Madrid replace Cruz and Modric and what they bring to the table? And my answer for the longest time has been there is no replacement. Those guys are two of the greatest, arguably the two greatest players in their position ever. They're unicorns. You don't just find these guys. You don't just like you know, pick them off a tree. You don't just promote someone from Castilla. You don't just sign someone for a hundred million even. It's a very rare breed of footballer. So my answer was always like, well, you just don't and you do your best and you play a different brand of football with the midfielders you have. It's a different, you know, when you have Kamavinga, many Fede, Jude, you know, it's a lot of lungs on both ends, players who can carry the ball forward, players who can track and transition, players who can cover ground. But I don't know. I'm I'm starting to think I was maybe wrong about that. And we do need someone who, to progress the ball like one of those guys. And I'm curious to know what you guys think about that. Do you really, even if they're, you know, inferior to some of the young midfielders that we have right now, do we need someone to do that? Do we need to get someone who fits that profile? What do you think? In the market, you mean? Yeah. So from wherever, wherever that market, Castilla, mark, I mean, it's got to be the market probably, but yeah. I I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Kamavinga is, will be fine in that kind of role and learning that particular skill. I think he has the, 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 the skill set to be efficient at, at that. It's just a matter of him picking picking his spots, I think, right now picking an understanding of the game and having a better maybe understanding of the position and the, and the needs of the team in that particular in that particular sense so i i i wouldn't think so i wouldn't think so i would lean towards no yeah for me it's well it's interesting because i do think that when cross leaves the player who's called to kind of replace in some ways his closest contribution to the team would be Camavinga. He's the best fit to do this. He's the one uh, who's most comfortable being the guy who directs play behind the ball. Um, which again, he, w- he would direct play in a very different way to how Kroos would do it. For example, 
uh, a team directed by Camavinga would have a lot less pause than a team di di directed by by Kroos. Uh, but I think he would be the best fit for that, and that's why I don't think it's. I don't necessarily think that it's it's a problem if the team doesn't really replace Kroos with someone of a more similar profile, because in the end. I do think Kamavinga has the talent to play that role in a different way. Although I do have to say that in the back of my head, for I do have, I am watching Champions League games, like thinking, thinking a bit like, will this team? Maybe the team doesn't notice like that ab Gross's absence that much in La Liga, but will how much will it notice it in Champions League? Because I like I was watching uh, the Leipzig game, or the Leipzig games, thinking, okay. But like before, when Kroos and Modric always played, like there were issues when the team defended, of course. But when both of these guys played, the team had an ability to slow down games and control what was happening with the ball in a way that even with just Kroos, it didn't have it as much. If you take out Kroos, it will have it even less, even if you had Camavinga there. So in the end, I do kind of have concerns that we ha without Kroos and Modric, Will this team be able to control things with the ball at the highest level against the toughest opponents? That's the thing that keeps ringing in the back of my head. Like, will they be able to do it? If you needed to look for someone in the market, I think right now the best options, he's a complicated personality, but Kimmich is about like he's having contract issues with Bayern and say Gross leaves this summer, it would be like a very natural per like player to replace him and then the other thing is Chelsea needs to sell players and Enzo Fernandez hasn't been doing that well and I think out of the new generation of midfielders Enzo is the one that looks the more that plays the most like gross I would say Enzo is someone I thought of but and but the thing the funny thing is like you mentioned Kimmich and Enzo and you know we really really have to think really hard to even think of two players that are possibly available, which just shows how rare the player we're talking about is, yes. right? And Those I, are and the only roles I would think that are on a similar level. And you'd have also to accept the fact that if they come, in a way, it's like a vote of no confidence on Camavinga, you know? So yeah. that yeah. also has an impact. That's that's a troubling thing I have, yeah. So let, let me be clear. I think the future of the left central midfield belongs to Kamavinga to me. And I and I, I still think that's his best position because that from there, he's really good at covering for fullbacks. He can get up in the left half space. He can also get into attacking zones more than he would if he was a DM. And he's really good. His, his movement between the lines as an outlet is fantastic. And I think that's a strength that you want to utilize. But I also just think it, it would be good to have a profile like that in the squad. Because Kamavinga progresses the ball as a ball carrier, not as a passer necessarily. Um, I think those I two are too good for for the current roster Real Madrid have. The ideal thing would be to kind of being able to trust Ceballos a little bit more. Ceballos, which um, is problematic considering that this issue would come at the highest in the highest stage, right? In in the Champions League semifinals, Champions League quarterfinals. I don't see Ceballos in that context ahead of the midfielders we, we already not have. As a starter, so no. definitely. I mean, so yeah, that's the, the issue. Fine. That's the issue I have. Yeah. Maybe Guler can grow into it. I don't know. Mm, uh, I don't we'll see, see it right now. Yeah. Uh, but he's also a different type of player and, and but but it's someone that, you know, he's only eight is he still eighteen? Yeah, he's, he's too been, young. Too young. No, I, I'm just saying that he has so much time to develop. Oh yeah, and, sure, and still, sure, and and possibly develop into a uh, you know a reliable progressive passer from deep positions. Um, I guess we can take another super chat here because I was going to jump into Rodrigo discussion now. Mm -hmm. Second City Saint, uh, thank you for the donation. Says Rodrigo is not consistent enough for an elite club like Real Madrid. I just thought today he got into good positions um, and his shots weren't great. I mean, the one that, that I really thought of, of that it was a fantastic chance that he just kind of, and this goes, I think Mehedi talks about this a lot where he talks about Rodrigo's ball striking and it's not, you know, kind of like the Jude or even Vinny level of ball striking ability. The one where he had 
uh, Understat hasn't updated their. Uh, I was just going to bring up Understat's shot chart, but I think I have it in my notes. Hold on. Um, I can't find it. But it, there's that great transition attack in the second half, and Rodrigo gets a really, really good chance in the box, and he just shoots it right at the keeper. Those ones just have to be better. Um, so the consistency is an issue. I think you can talk about, you know, the things he does well consistent, consistently is create space for others, defend, press, uh, get into good goal scoring positions. But right now the goal scoring is just not consistent. And I think that needs yeah. to improve. I just want to say one quick thing about Rodrigo, because I've been thinking about this hard for the last few days or so. What's does he have an elite skill like in the 99 percentile? I I struggle finding one in his in his skill set. With Vinicius, you can Dribbling. say he's he's would you say so though? Yes. Because he doesn't take advantage of his dribbling ability that much because he, he I think he lacks a burst of acceleration that Vinicius has. So Vinicius obviously does have that amazing dribbling technique, plus he can take advantage of it because of, of the quick burst after it. So I don't know. I don't know. I struggle seeing any elite, truly elite skill in, in Rodrigo to make the difference for a big club like Real Madrid. I'm, I'm, I'm officially worried about, uh, about him right now. I think we've been, we've been, um, I think he's been, having a, a very um, underwhelming season considering the role he's been given. I think we all expected a little bit more from him. And, and apart from a three-week stretch where he was really hot, he's, he just doesn't have it. He just doesn't have it. I think in terms of what he's elite at, I, I, his dribbling, his ball carrying, his passing is very good, all those things. He needs to... So, to me, those are very good, not elite. I don't know. We can agree to disagree. Obviously, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I I think he he I, you know, we we probably have three of the best dribblers in the world in Vinny, Jude, and Rodrigo. I, I think I, Brahim is a better dribbler than Rodrigo. Which says a lot about Rodrigo not being an elite dribbler. <laughs> that the fact that he has that, that the, the the fact that we have three dribblers ahead of him in Madrid already. I think Rodrigo, I like him as so I like him as a dribbler and ball carrier in central areas. And I really think there it's very hard for me to think of five players uh, who are like uh, more elite than him specifically in that aspect. But in general, as a dribbler, like if he goes at it from wide areas, uh, he struggles a bit more. Obviously, the le from the left, he comes in like, I think from the left, he looks a lot better as a dribbler than from the right, which is part of the issue, of course. Like we haven't, it's hard for us to see the best dribbling version of Rodrigo when we see him mostly off the right, which, which, is, a, which is another problem. But all in all, especially in central areas, I think there aren't many attackers who are better than him with the dribbling and ball carrying. But it's, kind of more specific if you have if you have him going off the right wing then of course it's not good it's not gonna be that it's not gonna be that good but all in all I, at least right now in terms of output yeah Rodrigo hasn't been consistent enough for an, uh, for to be a starter at Real Madrid that's the reality would it be better if he were on the left probably but that's not going to happen so that's kind that's the reality that he's going to have to get used to. But and, and I also like I push back on the whole left wing thing a lot. I don't think this whole thing of him being better on the left. Like we've seen him on the left too for large stretches when Vinny was out. We he had similar problems, right? <laughs> so I don't I Fair. don't think like the positional thing is that. And we've seen him excel in a ten. And and he himself has said last year that he prefers playing in the middle more. He said this. So I I think. Yeah. I think we sometimes push this narrative too much that he's better on the left and it's not his fault when he is here and stuff. So I, you know, at some point we just have to stop making too many excuses for everybody. Like we just need him to step up. And uh, I said it like, you yeah. know, I, I still, my take is still that I think his ceiling is higher than Brahim and he's better than Brahim, but I'm also fully aware that Brahim right now is better. Like Brahim is having a better season. He's, he's in better form. Yes. 
So let's see what it looks like, you know, over a sample size of three to five years and, and talk about it. But Rodrigo, I think, does need to step up. I think that's totally fair to expect him to do more. Not, um, to throw, yeah. m- not to throw a lot of shade on him, but he's just making Real Madrid's decision for next year way easier right now. Like, Real Madrid would be in a bit of a headache uh, if, uh, this is obviously assuming Mbappe signs for Madrid, uh, deciding who sits on the bench next year if Rodrigo were, have, were to be having a decent, no, not a decent, uh, a 25, 20 goals uh, season year. Yeah. And the fact that he's not having this kind of year and this kind of season is just making Real Madrid's decision next year, Ancelotti's decision for next year, definitely way easier. In terms of the lineup, yeah. for sure. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And adding to the and the last thing, just adding to the position thing that Kian mentioned, like there were times where Rodrigo gets put on the right and he moves to the center and the left anyways. He takes that initiative. But lately, I haven't been seeing him take as much initiative moving to those areas. So that's also, like, that's, that's the thing. Like, sometimes... It's fun when you get to see a player kind of rebel against the position he was given. And the, like the best Rodrigo kind of did that. Like he just started from the right, but then he played most of the game elsewhere. And he's not doing that right now. Like he's just kind of staying, like he's not taking enough initiative to just move to where he uh, where, where he plays best. There were a couple of times today where I thought he drifted to the left, which was interesting because then Vinny would tuck in centrally and Brahim would go in, you know, more centrally too. But it was it was rare. And um and this is one thing that we always say that he's always the one with the lowest amount of usage, generally speaking, of the front three. Uh where do you guys want to move to next? I'll leave it up to you. I've been dictating enough. <laughs> Mm, it's hard for me to find uh, more uh, worthy taking po- uh, talking points uh, after this game, really. And thankfully, again, it's sometimes good to have one of these uh, cruise control wins where everything comes easy from uh, from early in the game. So it's it's really hard. I don't know. Maybe Jose has a has a better idea. Yeah, not my like. From my end, not much to add. Well, as far as the taxes, I think I mentioned the main things, which is that I like Camavinga's role there. I like kind of the use of more of a 4-4-2 instead of a 4-3-3. I think the team just was just overall more solid in a lot of areas. Fede's position was also curious because, again, not all, he was wide right, but also many times... Uh, he was just at the same height of the pitch as the other attackers. So it, it it often felt like the team was playing more kind of a 4-2-4 four, four, with Fede just being almost like one of the forwards. So all in all, and, and one of the nice narratives about this season is that after years of complaining that this team did not have a right side, I the last few months, I, there's been a lot of right side action held by Fede taking this kind of sometimes playing more uh, uh, out on the right helped by Lucas having like a Lucas both Lucas and Carvajal having really good seasons it's mm-hmm. been after like a lot of quiet seasons on the right it's been kind of a good season to Embraim oh Embraim also playing from the right so there's a lot of noise uh, from the right side these days and i think that's very nice to see it's been more symmetrical than i i thought i forget which game it was recently we did a preview show like right before the kickoff and I was like, this is going to be completely asymmetrical. Everything's going on the left. And I was so wrong. Like, it was so much more right side heavy than I thought. So we've been seeing that more uh, recently. And, yeah, shout out to the right side, which uh, held its own today with uh, without Carvajal as well. Um, I'm just looking at Ancelotti's post-game quotes. Nothing really interesting. Just a quick shout to the Turkish fan base, Turkey, uh, Turkish army. Who were what are they doing all- now? They they were all th- uh, thanking uh, Ceballos for the assist after that beef they had with him. Oh, he squashed? <laughs> after, That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, wow. they, they are best friends now. It's great. It's just great to see. I have a I have a screenshot here. I think it's just I love that. <laughs> the on the Instagram comments all saying, "Oh, thanks, this. thanks, Danny, thanks, Danny. We love you." So yeah, <laughs> 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 they definitely cleared the air. It seems That's that. hilarious. Oh man, that's hilarious. Um, I have a rant. Oh, go ahead. The own goal rule. With Rudiger's goal, yeah, 
I'm giving that to Rudiger. I don't. I don't want to hear it. People are like, oh, but, <laughs> but Keon, the ball wouldn't have gone in if, if, <clears throat> if it wasn't for the goal. I don't want to hear it. No, I don't want to hear this nonsense. Rudiger <laughs> leapt up for the header. Give the goal to the last attacker who had the ball, who touched the ball. Now, in the case of our third goal, fine, own goal. I don't care. That one was clearly more. But Rudiger is the instigator. Give that man his goal. I'm done with this own goal nonsense. Unless it's clearly, 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 clearly has nothing to do with the attacking player. Give it to the last person who touches it. That's the way the rule used to be. That's the way the rule should be. Rudiger should have a goal to his name tonight. End of rant. I completely agree. I completely agree. It's nonsense. So, to me, the, that goal, that goal is. I will remember that goal as Rudiger's zone. I and Rudiger probably doesn't care much about the statistics and and the number of goals he's he's scoring every season. Obviously, this can matter when deciding a, a golden boot or a Pichichi by the end of the year. But thankfully, this is not the case <clears throat> with Rudiger. And but yeah, I, the rule is pretty much nonsense. I agree. The the players tapping Rudiger's head after every goal yeah. was awesome. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Re- play, like pretending it's just like a drum that they can just play. Uh, <laughs> also, here's a here's a pitch. Can we do, can we just make Ramadan three hundred and sixty five days a year? <laughs> does it enhance performance? I have a theory that it does. I think it does. Like, look, I like I'm fasting right now because I don't know if people know, but I'm Baha'i. So like Baha'is around the world, we fast from March first to. 19th this year from sunrise to sunset and i can't tell you like how much my performance improves cognitively when i have no calories in my system it's a different ball game because as soon as you eat you're just like ah i just want to like sit down i want to nap like even my workouts are better i now it's probably not sustainable to do a 365 days a year but i think i'm a big believer and i think we should circle ramadan as like and and look at all the the players who practice Islam on our team and just be like, okay, that month, you guys, they're, they're going to be in for. We got to make sure they start every game. Rest them in the other games. During Ramadan, they start. Can't, can't forget Ramadan, Karim as well. <laughs> I shared my screen, Kian, to show uh, a few comments on, on the, on the oh, Instagram on. publication. There we go. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me hide this comment so we can see it better. <laughs> There's a few of them. <laughs> Turkey, love you, love you, Sabayos. Thank you, bro. Thank you, too, King. Congratulations, King. Amazing. Oh, this is on Sabayos' Instagram post? This is on Sabayos' own Instagram account. <laughs> they went, they marched Amazing. to Sabayos' own Instagram account to, to show him love, yeah. So, yeah, Incredible. nice. <laughs> Until the next beef. Until, like, someone, like, this is going to be a thing for as long as Guler is alive and is a Real Madrid player. He's going to be, like, if, if someone, like, looks him off and shoots selfishly instead of passing to him, yeah. there's yeah. going to be beef rekindled. Um, all right. Willard says, I think, by the way, thank you so much for the, the generous donation, Willard. I think Rodrigo excelled at playing the false line position when we played 4-3-3. I thought that he would have played more in the CAM position with Joselu up top this year when Jude doesn't play. Ancelotti should probably try him there. His best games definitely came during that stretch when Vinicius wasn't available and Real Madrid were playing with uh, both Bellingham and, and Brahim as well. Those were the That was the best stretch for him, I think. Even though, again, he struggled in some games as well. It's not that he was extremely consistent by any means, but it's just hard for him. To, it's just hard to find a role for him at this point in this squad. I, it feels to me that you pretty much have to build your entire squad around him if you want him to perform or, or at a high or, or a consistent level. So, And that obviously doesn't make any sense when, when be- players like Bellingham and and Benicius are better than him, and Mbappe next season will be better than him as well. So I mean, it's just it's a difficult situation to be in with, with Rodrigo at this point, yeah. Yeah, and I think he was going to have... Uh, he, he could have been given more of that 10 role this season, but then Brahim came in and showed that he also... Because in the end, what ended up happening is that Brahim got given that role of basically Jude substitute when he's not there <laughs> instead of Rodrigo. And... I don't think it's necessarily a wrong de- a wrong decision because I think what we've said it like Brahim in general has been adapt like he's kind of adapted 
uh, to the situation better than Rodrigo had. Like, Rodrigo now gets mm. a bit more isolated on the right. He's struggling a bit more there. Brahim doesn't care. He does like he does whatever's needed for, from there. You put him at 10, he also puts on a good performance. Um, so, all in all, I think, uh, yeah, I think Rodrigo uh, in kind of that false 9 or 10 role makes sense. It's just that this year, Brahim earned the right to start to play there. Uh, over Rodrigo, and I do think, uh, well, both Rodrigo and Brahim do a, a fair amount of defensive work. I particularly yeah, like yeah. the intensity with which Brahim yeah, the is effort. defending lately, which yeah, I do think is a reason why Ancelotti thinks about using Brahim there too, like the defense. Yeah, you intensity. cannot complain about the effort from from Rodrigo either. It's just a matter of him not having it offensively. And the effort is there. The the intensity is there at all times. It's just the fact that he's just missing his chances. It's just he's he's plain and simple underperforming. So it's it's troubling at this point in time. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen for a couple quick items on statistics, if you don't mind. Let me just bring it up here. So we always like to go over the uh, Mark Stats Twitter account because we love Mark Stats. It's our favorite, my personal favorite Twitter bot. It's the only good bot on Twitter. Elon, your your entire app is filled with robots and nonsense. This Poor is the Jose only behind the, the, the super chat now. What's that? Poor Jose is hiding behind the super chat on the screen now, though. <laughs> what do you mean? It's okay. Just, uh, <laughs> just hide maybe the super chat now because all, the, his webcam, his face is hiding behind it on the. On the oh, I see. That's what okay. I was That's so okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. There I can be. Go. I can. I, I could be there yeah. from the shadows too. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Uh, Mark Satspot, uh goes over expected threat, expected goals, possession, field tilt, defensive action, everything. Our, our defensive action height, everything is wildly in our favor. Penalty box shots, deep completions, build-up completion, passes per defensive action, shows our aggressive press compared to Celta's. By the way, Celta were terrible. I think we mentioned that at least once. <laughs> <or twice. laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Luka Modric versus Celta Vigo. Look at this. Just really good performance, yeah. Incredible. Won the ball 10 times? Didn't even mention that. Um also, you can see our past networks here. Uh, pretty basic, like, as you said, Jose, they're talking about symmetry. Like, we had a lot go through the right yeah. as well. Um, and then ball progressors via carry, via pass, Modric top right. And uh -huh. I'm going to also go over our XG really quick or uh, via understat. Give me a second here. Um, this one here we'll go over these ones really quick so this is a massive chance from Vinny why don't I remember this one oh this was his goal this was just yeah. right before okay so that skews yeah. it a little bit yeah um, Rudiger is this also part of the goal that was just the own goal probably so minutes? probably so that's uh, a header so that, that counts as the header then. hitting the crossbar yeah, yeah. yeah. RxG is a little bit skewed then and then this one also skews it because this is the modern yeah, one. I think that's, that's the easiest. first one. Yeah. yeah. This one, Hozulu. This was the big one outside of those sequences in the eighth yeah. minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Um, let me just, you guys have anything else? I'm going to go over my notes really quick, but. Not for me. I think we got it all. I'm yeah, I think so. My notes. So. Yeah. The big the big points from the game, yeah. Like I think we've got we've covered mostly covered, yeah. Because we cover Lucas, we've yeah. Then Rudy, I mean Rudiger has been at his usual level just right now. Just the the baldness gives an extra incentives <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so yeah. Um yeah, I think Matt mentioned this on Twitter, but you know, Mortar just said peace delivery. Yeah, uh, on yeah. point, on, on point. point. Yeah. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, this week in particular, and for sure next week, I think the next week is international break. We're going to be doing almost everything on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. Or if you don't have Patreon in your country, YouTube memberships tab does the same content. Sign up for either or doesn't really matter to us or you, whichever one you want to do. 
Um, but we're going to be pretty much exclusively on Patreon and doing live calls for members for the next couple of weeks um, with some ex exceptions here and there. So make sure you're a member. Uh, we also wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. And let's bring in uh, some quick music to uh, bring this these shout outs into question. Here's, I'm trying to find a good one. <laughs> this one's nice. Hey, lo fi, yeah. This one's called Night Driving. Big fan. <laughs> Very chill. I can totally picture myself driving to this as the sun is setting. <laughs> um, so, shout out to all of our patrons because without you, we are literally nothing. And all of our patrons get access to a ton of bonus content. Shout out to $10 plus patrons because. If you pledge $10 or more per month, not only do you get access to the entire bonus content catalog, you also get guaranteed responses to your questions on each podcast we do. You also get a specific shout out on the podcast. So shout out to these $10 plus uh, patrons as follows. <clears throat> Got to clear my throat for this one. Daniel Smith, Ramtin Makhrur, Bella Chow, Adam Dorsey, Adar Zalukovic, Azaz Hussein, Alex Perez, Alex Thyberg, Alexandria McCaskill, Ananya Kumar, Anthony Tharp, Armando L, Armand Gashi, Arnab Mukherjee, Brandon Stevens, Brendan Powers, Carlos Fuentes, Krishna Costa, Christian Toff, Connor McMorrow, Daniel Williams, Deadpool Lover, Edward Sossman, Eloy Enriquez, S.A. Davisito, Fabian Moreno, Frederick Sundros, Frederick Rantakiro, Gary Kohut, Graham Girard, Howard Moore, Hamed, Ian Marley, Jacob P., Jason Fitz, John Fernandez, Jose Cruz, Jose Osorio, Kevin Rivera, Khalfan Alkabi, Kunal Tilakar, Leon Savernakis, Logan Stahl, Magnus Lex, Martin Ridman, Matthew Atkins, Marin Myrtle, Michael Zinberg, MJ Diego, Ndaba Halambangana, Nelson Masariego, Nick Rivero, Nicholas Moller, Omar Maro, Oscar Barrera, Paulo Fierro, Peter P, Phoenix, Rishi D, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Said Mahad, Samer Z, Samuli Justin, Santos Solorzano, Sergio Arispe, Sheikh Hatiri, Somanchu Singh, Sujaiwani, Sushank Damala, Tahmid Kalam, Thomas Berg, Tobias Royal Bacher, Wamik Jamal, Wasim Haddad, Will Sousa, and Willie Reed, and Brandon Alvarez. You guys are absolute legends. Thank you so much for your support. Lucas, thank you. Jose, thank, thank you, man. you. Listeners, thank you. If you join late, this will be posted on the podcast feed on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast app. Um, tomorrow, we are doing a stream, a live uh, Zoom call for our members. And then the day after, Lucas and I are doing a live call for members. Um, I'm not sure what else, but just on this, I'm going to put myself on the spot. We'll probably do a live stream for the Champions League draw. If you guys like that. If you guys don't want it, no worries. We won't do it. But if you want it, we'll do it. All right. Thanks, guys. Jose. Thank you. Lucas, thank you. Thanks, Guillaume. Thanks, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace out. See ya.